Hello, everyone. Welcome to today's MBS webinar on designing healthier workplaces, sponsored by Oscar Acoustics, looking at improving the health and well-being of workers in office environments through quality design and specification. General housekeeping today is that the webinar will run to just over an hour. And if you have any questions, please don't hesitate to add those in the chat window visible as part of the platform. Whilst there are lots of types of places where people work, factories and airports, supermarkets and hotels, our focus here is predominantly offices. And our webinar today will look at how workplace environments can evolve into collaborative and creative places that still ensure quiet, focused work and privacy needs. As we'll hear from my guests, there are a hundred different factors that impact workplace well-being, including culture, opportunities for exercise, even company management styles. But we'll narrow our focus down to areas around human comfort, designing for health, and the complex specification decisions around ventilation, lighting levels, and particularly noise and sound control. I'm really proud of today's session. Can't wait to share these conversations with you. We have five brilliant minds willing to share their expertise and knowledge. Firstly, Ben Channon of Design for Wellbeing Consultancy, Eckist, and the author of Happy by Design and the Happy Design Toolkit, two books that are really practical and that I've learned a lot from. We'll follow that with two conversations from the International Wellbuilding Institute team, beginning with Anne-Marie Aguilar, Senior Vice President for the EMEA region, with real insight introducing the key concepts of the Well Standard, and then Ethan Bordeaux, their technical specialist for the sound concept in terms of acoustics and how Well Standard approaches that. And then I've got a great conversation with Julian Demetz of Demetz Forbes Knight Architects, talking through a number of recent workplace case studies and explaining their design philosophy, including their reasons for reinvesting in their own practices office space in London's Fitzrovia. And from our sponsor today, Oscar Acoustics, their managing director, Ben Hancock, will show us how their products like Sonospray help achieve reduced reverberation and increased acoustic control, helping you to understand the potential of those solutions. Finally, we'll briefly look at how MBS Chorus and MBS Source can be used in combination to specify healthier workplaces. So let's get started. Okay, thanks so much, Ben, for this. Um, could you start by uh, introducing yourself and uh, tell us a bit about your work? Hi, Paul. Yeah, well, great to meet you and thank you for having me. Um, so my name is Ben Channon. Uh, I'm, I'm an architect, trained as an architect, um, but actually uh, a couple of years ago took a bit of a sideways step uh, and now I work as a, a specialist advisor uh, focusing on healthy buildings. So uh, for me, it was a bit of a personal journey and uh, I, in my sort of mid-20s became really interested as an architect in uh, how we could how we could make healthier buildings and, and by healthy I don't necessarily mean kind of eco-friendly or, or sort of focusing on this, the environmental side of things but really looking at human health so how can we create spaces whether that's our homes our workplaces whatever that might be um, places that actually really enhance our daily lives make us feel healthier um, and again that could be anything from our things like our lung and our heart health and our, our brain health um, right through to our, our mental health our relationship with those people around us and, and our productivity. Yeah, and I guess when we think about the importance of health and well-being, um, you know, two words that you're associated with, I guess, are mindfulness and as a result of your books, happiness. Can you describe what they mean in terms of your journey through building design and architecture? Yeah, absolutely. So um, I, th I think one thing that is important to say is I've always been very interested in that kind of tactile experiential side of architecture. And I think a lot of architects are um, certainly coming, th coming through that, that educational process. Um, I, I saw a lot of other architectural students who were really interested, you know, whether it's that that materiality um, and the way that we have relationships with our senses, whether that's touch or sound or smell even. Um, and, we, you know, we do live in a very visual world, don't we? So I think it's really important that we we still retain uh, that, that element to what we do. But for me, then it was about just joining up the dots, really, and taking a lot of the work that was going on in, in things like um, environmental psychology, where they were, you know, you have scientists really trying to understand and, and study why things affect us in certain ways, and then bring that together with, with what I was learning at architecture school. Because to me, that was the missing piece of the jigsaw puzzle that we didn't necessarily get taught. You know, yes, it's great to talk about tactility and can a space make you feel more mindful, can it help you engage with your senses? But then... The, yeah, that, that final sort of connecting the dots was, okay, but how does that make us feel and why does it make us feel that way? And we have the science to tell us those things now. So, yeah. yeah. That's fantastic. And later in the session, we'll be looking at the well building standard and um, the 
International Wellbuilding Institute. You're an accredited practitioner of, of well. Can you tell me a bit about that journey and, and why that's important to you? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so again, for me, it was about um, trying to get a better understanding of all of those different ways in which buildings affect our health. And um, I, I, I got a, I kind of started in the area of mental health because that was the area that was kind of most personal to me, having having gone on a bit of a mental health journey myself uh, and, and certainly then getting into the worlds of, of mindfulness and meditation and, and things like that. Um, so I, I started off with this real fascination of how do buildings affect our mental health, but then I, it was just a little bit of a thread that once I started pulling on it, I kind of couldn't stop. And, um, certainly then kind of wanted to get a more holistic understanding of, okay, how does it affect, um, you know, everything from, uh, our musculoskeletal health, uh, to our life expectancy even, um, and, and, as as you'll know, mental health and physical health are so intrinsically linked that I also just felt it was impossible mm. to look at one and not the other. Um, so that's one of the great things about Well is it, it does kind of look at um, not just all parts of the of a building, but all parts of the body and all parts of health. What what does it mean to be healthy? Um, and so that's why I've um, you know I, I was lucky enough a few years ago to be asked to join the advisory panel as well for one of their concepts for the mind concept. Um, so uh, that you know that that because of the fact that well is um it's very holistic it's very scientific and evidence based that was why i kind of was was more than happy to go ahead and really um commit to supporting well and, and excellent yeah there's a focus i guess today of workplace design in particular and there's a few factors that you discuss um in your books that relate closely to workplace design in general though what do you think are the key things that create workplaces that really support well-being you know beyond perhaps those personal relationships and um, the the job itself. Yeah, I, I think that's a really good point in a sense that uh, the, the personal side of things is, is huge and the workplace culture is enormous. And it's, it's very important to say that without those things, you can create the most fantastic building in the world. Um, but if you don't get those other basic ingredients right, um, it's a bit like, you know, a bit like the kind of the fire triangle. Um, you need kind of fuel, heat and oxygen. And similarly, you know, if, if you take away um, good workplace culture, if you take away good people, you can have the best building ever. It's not, it's not going to work. But um, in terms of what, what makes a great building, um, it's uh, well, there's a lot of things that we could talk about and, and obviously, I'm always tempted here to, to run through the, the various chapters of my book, but um, it's yeah. it's really, it does, I suppose a, a certain amount of it does come back to what you were talking about earlier, the idea of creating spaces that are more mindful, engage our senses, engage mm. us with nature as well. Um, and I don't want to talk too much about biophilia today because it's sort of been done to death, but things like giving people access to good daylight. Um, yes, you're getting biophilic benefits from that, but you're also getting huge benefits to, to your sleep, um, to your eye health. Um, and, and of course, when you're sleeping better, we know that that impacts your mental and your physical health. Uh, it's, it's also about trying to, we've, we've talked already about encourage people to be more engaged with their bodies, but make people more active. Um, can, can a workplace encourage mm. movement? Can it encourage uh, active travel? And again, that doesn't just mean, oh, well, we've got some bike stands, so we're all good. Like you also need to put in loads of showers and change rooms and lockers and all those other important facilities. Um, and even can we push people instead of taking uh, taking the lift? Can we encourage them to take the stairs? And so often you'll visit these kind of spaces and, um, you know, the stairs are almost like kind of hidden away. They're, they're a fire escape that no one takes. And that's such a shame because mm. we know like that, that climbing stairs is kind of something that, uh, you know, the majority of the population can do and the health benefits of doing it are enormous. But so why, why aren't we pushing it more? It's such a simple design move. Mm. Um, and of course, acoustics, very, sort of very timely for today. But again, it's, it's one of the biggest distractors, one of the biggest issues that people complain about in workplace design. And it, it opens up so many questions when we start to talk about acoustics. You know, it's, it's, we, we start to think then about materials. Um, and again, we could talk a lot about toxicity mm. and other issues not to do with acoustics. But um, you're also thinking then about, about layout as well, um, about proportions of spaces, many kinds of issues. And of course, external noise as well. How are we dealing with external as well as those internal sources? So as you've uh, mentioned our focus of uh, the case studies, particularly today, is acoustic control and managing noise. And before we get into the design decisions that influence noise, what are the factors in terms of how noise affects 
the things you've talked about around mindfulness and happiness and comfort. Are there specific uh, design ways that you can begin to think about improving mindfulness, improving spaces um, with relationship to sound? Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, and as I've, as I've already mentioned, sound tends to be one of the biggest complaints we see in, in almost every workplace, um, people complaining about noise and, and noise pollution and distractions. Um, uh, but at, at this point, I think it's also really important to say that people overlook the impact of noise quite quite significantly. Um, people think of noise as something that's maybe a bit of a distraction or it's a little bit annoying, but actually um, it's it's one of the items that's really high on the World Health Organization's list of kind of environmental health concerns. Um, they're, they're particularly worried about obviously kind of noise pollution in cities, um, but th the reason they're so concerned is when you look at the data, there actually is a correlation between noise pollution and rates of things like heart attacks. Um, so we know that actually when we're hearing noise, what's, what, what's basically happening is we're becoming more stressed. Our blood pressure is rising. Um, it's um, it's not just a case of, uh, oh, well, that's just a bit annoying, but, you know, put up with it. It really does have a, a significant impact on people. So, uh, yeah, interesting. You, you talk about things like um, like mindfulness and, and it's also bringing to mind that idea of kind of focused work or we, we talk about the flow states and um, you know, people, you hear various statistics about how long it takes to get into a flow state, but people roughly sort of tend to agree around 15 to 20 minutes. Um, and it can take remarkably little, particularly with, in terms of noise, um, to, to distract us from that, from that flow state. You can, you know, you, you can very much control what you look at. It's very hard to control what you hear. Um, so that's why, one of the reasons why um, noise and, and uh, sound is such an important uh, issue to think about. In the States, um, they are, they they are far more uh, used to using things like sound masking systems, which, to be perfectly honest, we almost never see here in the UK. Uh, I've worked on um, a number of office projects now that are achieving really up at the top end of well. Um, and when you talk to people about sound masking systems, it's it's just not something that really is is normal here at all. Um, so, uh, it's, can you explain that, what a sound masking system is? I can do my best. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I should point out I'm not a, a specialist acoustician or a specialist um, sort of M&E engineer, but um, effectively, uh, and apologies to any acousticians who I'm, I'm going to butcher this now, but um, effectively the best way to think about it is it, it generates a sort of background noise. It's, it's not quite a kind of white noise, but it's, it sits sort of roughly on the speech frequency, the, the sort of spectrum of noise that speech um, functions at. And therefore, what it means is um, you, you still you, you, you get used to it very quickly. It's not like you just hear a buzzing all day. Um, but what it basically does mm -hmm. is it means that people can have conversations in an open plan office without everybody hearing them. It kind of just very cleverly just they blend into that background noise. Um, and this is really important, too, because, uh, there's the, again, we would assume probably that an open plan office is great because it makes people more sociable. It means everyone talks to everyone and there's no boundaries between teams. But actually there's quite a lot of research out there to suggest that open plan offices make us less sociable. Um, particularly if you're an introverted person. I mean, it's uh, I'm, I'm naturally a more of an extroverted person, so I have to sort of put on my empathy hat here and try and imagine what it would be like. But if you're the sort of person who is very, very shy and the idea of um, speaking up in, in a public, more, in, more public environment is, is really quite, uh, intimidating to you then an open plan office is your absolute nightmare of course it's it's something that you know would, would be terrifying to some people so um what happens is you're more introverted people who often tend to have you know quite, maybe a slightly different perspective on things a different view and it's really important of course we're talking about getting diversity of viewpoints um, but if you're losing all of those viewpoints because mm. those people aren't speaking up um then you know it's having a really bad impact uh, not just on your office culture but also on kind of the way that you're working the quality of your output and and the, as i said the diversity of ideas that you're getting so it's really important that we we do create more of an environment where people do feel like oh i can chat to someone who's maybe diagonally across from me i can have a short conversation with them about a piece of work and the whole office isn't going to hear what i'm saying yeah and finally are there any references or further reading other than your own books that you'd recommend uh, that people look to gosh um yeah there's there's lots of really good books out there um elena gregorio has got a really good book on well-being in interior design um there's also um in terms if people are thinking kind of a bigger scale I, I love um charles montgomery's happy city um and then in terms of home design as well the, flora samuel has just brought out a really good book about 
um, how we can make healthier homes. Uh, and there's another one, I believe it's called The Healthy Home um, by Nick Baker and Cohen Steamers too. So uh, I have also already mentioned um, The Shaping of Us by Lily Bernheimer. So there's a bit of a reading list there, um, kind of touching upon a bit of sort of office design, just design psychology, home design and urban design too, and all of the ways in which we need to really be thinking about um, creating healthier places for people, whether that's mental or physical. Brilliant. We'll uh, make sure to link to those in uh, the resources that we share with the webinar. Ben, thanks so much for your time today. I really appreciate your insight and uh, your expertise in these matters of workplace wellbeing. Oh, great. Thanks so much for having me, Paul. Next up, I'm so pleased to introduce Amri Agrilar, EMA Senior Vice President for IWBI, the creators of the World Building Standard, which feels like such a core part of the future of designing healthier places. So Amory, feel free to start sharing when you're ready. Perfect. So this is sort of a, an introduction to well, we call it, you know, 101 or 1010 as, as an introduction, but give you a bit of information about myself. Um, I'm a senior vice president. I started the IWBI in the EMEA region back in 2016. Um, I spent 11 years with a company called Arup in London, heading up sustainability. And really this became the sort of jumping off point for me where I started looking at human sustainability. So the evolution of, of how we start to tie together the equal priorities of both human health and planetary health. Uh, give you a quick indication of how big the team is, which is really exciting. As I said, I started the group on my own in 2016. We're now up to about 13 folks, and we range between technical experts and folks that do business development. So here's a little introduction into, into WELL, and just a quick purpose statement about the IWBI is our mission is really to create people-first places, really helping to really lean into the fact that we are the trusted authority on health and wellness, health and well-being, and we look towards not only buildings anymore, but organizations and communities. And really coming out of a, a COVID world, health has many different focus areas. We looked at, you know, emergency preparedness uh, coming out of COVID. We're talking a lot today about diversity, equity, and inclusion. We know that climate change is a major public health issue. And also coming out of COVID-19 is understanding the impact of the built environment on our mental health. Also mentioning earlier this really strong focus on environmental, social, and governance, and how does health play into that role. And most importantly, we're always looking for the ROI of healthy buildings, which is how does this benefit employee engagement and productivity? So just to give you a bit of the history, um, we launched the actual standard in 2014, and it's really built on asking some of the questions that really have not been asked before, which is how does the built environment affect how we live as human beings? What's the impact on our health? And we, we started this in 2014 after a very intensive peer review process that really for the first time, I think, <clears throat> included the medical professionals from around the world, as well as real estate professionals and scientists and practitioners, like really asking the question, what, what is the impact on the human body when people are sitting in artificial light for eight to 10 hours a day? What happens when comfort isn't optimized? So these are the things that started the launch of the well building standard. And now in 2023, we're seeing uh, global adoption. Um, I think I've got a couple of sp specific numbers here, but just to give you an idea of the, the roadmap, uh, as I said, we launched in 2014. We then expanded into a master plan program in 2000, between 2017 and 18. We looked at how we can help clients who have multiple buildings. That's our well at scale program. In 2020, we launched specific ratings that address health and safety, which responded directly to the COVID pandemic. And now we're looking at the health equity rating, well for single family homes, well performance rating. So we're evolving the standard with the needs of our clients and customers. So this just gives you a quick indication of where we're at. Um, you can see the sort of hockey stick of, of growth. And, and I think what's really the most 
critical to see here is that our biggest growth period was during COVID between 2020 and 2022, where we saw over 4 billion square feet of space become part of the well family. And this is the, this is the foundation of well. These are the 10 concepts that drive the entire well version two. They deal with 10 of what we call, you know, absolutely critical concepts to achieve healthy buildings. And they range from mind and community and movement to areas that are much more familiar in real estate, like water, air, light, thermal comfort, and sound. And then also include specific focus on nourishment and food, as well as materials. And obviously, we're going to go through a little bit of detail on each one of these, just so you can get a flavor of what that means um, for the built environment. But air is obviously our, one of our most important concepts. During COVID-19, we realized the, the criticality of air, especially within buildings and ventilation systems. So here we're talking about what's the management of air quality? How do we monitor air quality and be aware of what's happening inside buildings? Start to improve the air supply, you know, fresh air and what type of particle filtration we use. And really looking at things that can contaminate air, um, microbes, molds, really looking at how we can prevent that from getting into the open plan areas. With water, it's, it's a very unique situation. You know, obviously, when we look at sustainability, we're talking about reducing the amount of water. For us here, we're looking very specifically at the quality of the water that we're allowing folks to drink and then promoting water consumption. One of the things we've learned in the well building standard is that there's a very high percentage of folks that are typically dehydrated and that affects multiple areas around concentration, depression, overall health. And we're learning now that we should be using the built environment as, as triggers to encourage the awareness of some of these healthy routines and habits. The third area that, you know, you very rarely see when we're talking about real estate is the impact of food. So we work closely with clients who do provide food on site to make sure that it has, you know, correct transparency around nutritional content. Portion management is, is really advertised and controlled. And also in alignment with what type of food we provide, what type of spaces do you provide for people to eat? And I know that sounds quite, you know, unimportant, but getting people to remove themselves from screens and workplace to actually have a chance to eat and speak to other people has like multiple benefits. You mentioned light in our earlier discussion and light is really critical because we've been spending, you know, upwards of 90 to 95% of our time indoors. We tend to be under really unhealthy light when it comes to artificial light or reduced daylight and we rely on this artificial light, and that has massive impacts on our circadian rhythms and our hormone balances. So it's really important to look at that in detail. Movement is another critical area. This is about getting people away from sedentary behavior, looking at active opportunities with inside buildings, promoting physical activity, getting people to move around the space. Thermal comfort, I think, has been a very aware, you know, a program that we're very aware of in terms of how we keep people in their own thermal environment. But we're realizing that many of the performance metrics around comfort have been designed for 50-year-old white men in three-piece suits and not really the, the new types of, of community members that are sitting in office spaces. So really understanding how we can provide what we call thermal zoning between one and three degrees of difference in different spaces to allow people to work in environments that are more comfortable for them. Sound is another key area that I know we're gonna talk in extensive detail with our acoustics concept lead, but this really talks about understanding the, the mental health impacts of open plan areas and how do we reduce surface contact so that we can create spaces that have the absolute benefit of, of sound mapping and providing the right sound barrier for the right um, work requirement. Um, materials has been a really important aspect of the well building standard, and this deals with really pushing 
the supply chain to be transparent around the materials that we use inside buildings. And I, I mean that in regard to things like volatile organic compounds. So things like adhesives and sprays and glues, the things that we typically deploy inside buildings that we're not really aware of what those off-gassing impacts have on human health. So IWBI has taken a real stand to push the supply chain to be more transparent so we can make better decisions about the materials that we put inside space because they have an absolutely massive effect on our air quality inside buildings. And that also then leans into things like cleaning products and protocols. If you've done a lot of work in the air category to make sure the air is being filtered and we have extra ventilation requirements, the last thing you want is someone coming in with cleaning products at night <clears throat> and leaving all that off-gassing going on through the space. I love the fact that we have categories like mind and community. I think this has been a real turnaround for the real estate community to really understand that space can actually provide cognitive and emotional health just by providing connections to nature, restorative spaces, um, really being aware of the fact that we should be promoting mental health and finding ways within our work environment to address those issues. And that's, that's a really massive category today. Um, community is where we seem to capture a lot of our HR protocols and policies. So I'll show you that in the next couple of slides, but here is where we talk about things like universal design, accessibility, how are we supporting new parents, diversity and inclusion. So this is definitely the bucket where most of our policies come from. And I, I love this slide because to me, this is where it really brings it all together. Well is one of the first, and I think the only rating system that brings together policy, which is, which is often sitting in HR with the design coordination and with FM and operations. So it really takes that much more holistic view of how a building is designed and operated. I know you've asked a couple of times about like, how does well get applied? Well, well, typically in 2014, when we launched was looking specifically at commercial office space. We're really lucky now that we have Well version two, which was launched in 2019, which allows every building typology to come through the Well system. So student accommodation, education buildings, residential buildings, community centers, warehouses, you name it, they can come through the program. So it's been a really exciting transition. And then I think I just briefly wanted to touch on this really important topic about ESG. Uh, we definitely feel that Health is a, is a focus area that's very underrepresented in ESG. We know that environmental has been captured by all the sustainability rating systems, but we think health is like something that sits within the social component. Um, and we think it's really the next opportunity for market leadership within real estate. So this is a repetitive slide, but it just tries to follow through on that framework that says we're, we are aligning ourselves with GRESB and the UN SDGs, and actually each of our well features maps specifically across a UN SDG so that you can really see that alignment. And when you're working at scale with us, you would be able to get a report that shows how many of your buildings are addressing which specific SDGs. So we think that's a really important moment for our clients. Um, how does someone become part of this I call it the IWBI family, which is to become a well-accredited professional. Um, it is a really important profession, and it's a credential that I think really helps bring the awareness, not just to the real estate industry, but to the organization that they work for. So we have folks that, that work across um, health aspects, HR, design and construction. Like we have well APs that come across all of our different silos in, in this build, in this business. Thanks so much. That's been absolutely brilliant. That's a really good foundation, I think, for the conversation. And so many of those themes are things that I do want to dig into a bit more. I'm really interested in the idea that I suppose some of these things are quite intangible, maybe. And I guess one of the key aspects of well is the ability to define things around mind or community or nutrition or whatever those aspects might be that perhaps didn't have a way of certifying or a way of measuring prior to 
um, your work and, and the development of it? Yeah, I mean, when you think about the expansion of even the word biodiversity, you know, I mean, we stressed to folks that, you know, even just the exposure to natural elements, like it doesn't need to be a plant or a tree, but natural elements have increased connections to like lowering blood pressure, mm. lowering depression, you know, reducing anxiety, actually helping people to be more, um, <clears throat> they call it, you know, attentional capacity, being more aware and alert. You know, these are things that until we really brought the science to the table, like you said, it's it's almost too intangible to be able to, to find uh, enough of a basis to take that forward. And I think it's the same with things like even hydration. Like it's incredible the, the science that sits behind how dehydrated people are and mm. how that connects with their mental health, their sense of cognition, their sense of focus. So I think, you know, I don't, I never want to minimize that six or seven years of research that stood behind the launch of Well V1 because it was so impactful just to see the research and to be able to prove to people that like making these decisions is not just because it looks good or it sounds good. There's real science behind this. And I think it really changed the awareness of what we typically keep in a real estate bucket. You know, even like you mentioned, like we've, we've had so much information over the last, gosh, I don't even know how long on sound and thermal comfort. Mm. But then when you start to take it to the next level and you think, well, when were those regulations designed and who was the, who was the, you know, the protocol set against and that work environment or that stakeholder is much different today than it was 40 or 50 years ago. Even their dress code is completely different. Yeah. So, you know, so we've been able to kind of provide that insight that there is research out there and tying that research to the concepts and then providing features that people could readily deliver on site. And then through the whole benefit of post-occupancy evaluation, start to track the benefit. I mean, we've had <clears throat> clients track reduced absenteeism, improved retention on staff, like where they would normally lose between eight and 13% of their staff annually, that started to disappear. Like, you know, we're, we're starting to really get the ROI data. And, and one of the things I definitely want to follow through with is, is some of those reports, because it's now is the time where, where buildings have been occupied with a well building rating for three to five years. And we're now starting to see that data roll up into real great um, ROI benefits. Yeah, that's really where you do see those tangibles and the kind of ROI, the bottom line impacts um, as a result of making some of these changes and, and being more intentional about the, the way that we design. We'll have a, a number of designers and specifiers watching today, and many of them will be familiar with Well. I guess, is the desire, I suppose, for those individuals to become Well APs? Is that kind of the way that you hope development of use of the standard? Or is there a way that designers can implement it and its um, concepts in a in a way that doesn't require that level of understanding or depth of education, perhaps? Yeah, I mean, I think for, for the design community to be, to at least have one person in the team who's a well AP, it's almost like having one person in the team who's a BREAM AP. They need to be able to bring in that element of, of the importance of health so that it starts to become everything that you base your decisions on. You know, are we going with a deep plan office, well, actually, does that really make any benefit? How much natural light are we actually going to be able to bring into this space? I think all of those parameters will help a designer make better decisions. When it comes to products, uh, we've had product manufacturers become part of our membership program so that they have a voice. They can sit within any of the concepts that we have and, and have a voice into what's important. So I think we're also launching a program called Works With Well, where we're trying to, again, push the supply chain on transparency so that we can help our clients choose products that are actually healthier for them. So that's another way that product suppliers could start to become aware of building a relationship with us and helping, helping us influence where they need to be thinking about their products. I mean, reducing chemicals, you know, understanding what their off-gassing components are is, is massive. 
Well, thank you so much. I really appreciate you know all of your time today, and uh, I think you've contributed a huge amount of value um, to today's webinar. So thanks again, Anne Marie. No, it was my pleasure. Thank you so much. It was real, really interesting to have a nice informal chat about this. Thanks again. All right. Have a great day. Following on from Anne Marie, we've now got Ethan Bordeaux, lead for the sound concept at Well whose knowledge on sound and noise will help us dig into those parts of designing workplace acoustics for well-being and what the well-building standard has to say about it. Okay, excellent. So would you mind starting by um, introducing yourself and then um, I can kind of start asking a few questions from there. Um, thanks for having me. My name is Ethan Bordeaux. I'm the sound concept lead and performance verification lead at the International Well-Building Institute uh, where I've spent the past six or seven years uh, really deep in uh, the intersection of architectural acoustics and the human response to sound and noise, uh, thinking about both of those terms separately uh, in a number of building sectors and in project types, but um, really focused on how humans interact with sound, noise, and how it affects our health and well-being. That's excellent, yeah. And so when we talk about the well standard and the understanding of that there's clearly some uh, parts of that that really impact sound and noise and acoustics um not just the concept of sound but it kind of interweaves into all kinds of parts of it so how do you begin to uh, consider the assessment of acoustic comfort in buildings i think it's just that it's it's not thinking specifically with the technical nature of sound and the physics of, of sound through air as a medium, but rather that sound is a, a one piece in a larger puzzle of comfort. And oftentimes when we perceive sound or register noise, which is an interpretation of, of sound being sort of an umbrella term, we are doing so in a multi-sensorial capacity where it's not just the sound, it's what was I just eating? Um, what is the my exposure to nature or daylight? Uh, how is my thermal comfort registering uh, with where I'm currently maybe seated in an office or um, where I'm positioned in a classroom? There's a huge impact on how we register, make sense of, and then respond to sound, um, which could eventually become noise uh, instantaneously or over time, uh, noise being unwanted sound. Yeah, understood. And what are your um, experiences, I suppose, in terms of how well those acoustic comfort parameters are understood in industry and with the teams that you tend to work with? Is it an increasing awareness of the importance of these things? Um, or because they're so much part of our daily lives, people get those concepts quite quickly? I think it's a mix. There are definitely some more colloquial understandings of what noise may mean in our day-to-day -day lives. We experience that in our commutes, whether those are a part of the past uh, prior to uh, recent world events or, or now re-emerging as people return to the workplace. Those sounds of hustle and bustle, the interstitial periods between our lives at home and our lives at work, uh, the shape our lives in ways that we are either immediately cognizant of or are aware of after the fact. Um, uh, research out of the University of California, Irvine, was able to pinpoint that it takes approximately 24 minutes for an individual to return, regain focus after a distraction. And in the workplace, that is predominantly uh, acoustic distraction, um, given the way that office densification, uh, current design trends with hard and reflective surfaces, hard, hard floors, hard uh, lid ceilings in offices um, creates uh, and fosters uh, a frankly hostile acoustic environment in that it's difficult to tune out the sounds of the people around you. We, it's a lie that we tell ourselves, I think, as listeners and people who perceive uh, sound as information, that we can tune out this sound, that we can tune out noise. But our, our brains and our bodies are uh, a bit smarter than, <laughs> than that. We were constantly listening. We can't close our ears. We can't necessarily shut off that part of our brain that registers that sound as a potential threat, which is something that we know based on our human biology is a, a, a key element of, of survival. So I would caution people to uh, relegate that system to a tuning out of sorts. It's, it's, it's far more complex than that, and it has huge health implications, as I'm sure we'll get into in a second. 
I'm really interested as well by one thing that you mentioned there, the kind of idea that traditionally we might think of preventing noise from accessing a space or we may be um, lowering the amount of noise that is created by the occupants themselves. But in the standard, again, you notice that there are noise emitting things like HVAC systems and other mechanical equipment, the electronics that we use that are all creating noise as well. And I suppose that can be difficult to mitigate or control um, because it's creating noise within the space that you're trying to insert. Yeah, there are, there are a number of, of sources that are internal to a building or even external to a building that will elevate background noise levels. Um, we can safely say that they're noise because these aren't uh, sound emitting sources that are conducive to the intent of those spaces. It's not like a high level of mechanical equipment noise is intended to, to produce a higher uh, output of, of productivity in the workforce. However, there are sound emitting uh, uh, devices that that can foster that. There are two in particular that uh, one one that we do reference within the well uh, sound concept, which is sound masking, which provides a uniform uh, increase in the background sound level um, using an adjustable, equalizable pink noise spectrum. Mm. Not to be confused with white noise, which uh, I hear uh, a, a frightening amount of people still referencing. Um, which is not conducive to human comfort. Pink noise is a very warm uh, sound that you can adjust. Acoustical consultants primarily use this with acoustical testing, um, but it's also deployed in sound masking systems that help to increase background sound levels to a comfortable th upper threshold uh, to support speech privacy. So in an open office, when that's raised, it um, reduces the what is known as a speech uh, signal to noise ratio, such that uh, your ability to perceive, say, a neighbor uh, at another workstation is uh, gr that much more reduced. So it helps to foster productivity. It's been uh, researched uh, to a greater extent in Canada and it's deployed widely in North America, but seeing some international uptake, which is which has been uh, really interesting to, to see. And then there's another uh, element too, when, um, not in the realm of productivity, but in the realm of stimuli, which is uh, soundscape system design. And that's employing biophilic elements uh, or artificially generative sound sources that resemble nature or are directly plucked from natural environments using field recording techniques and similarly distributed in a, a spatially uniform uh, system uh, using loudspeakers uh, set to a, a comfortable level uh, where that sound can stimulate productivity and positive uh, occupant interaction and engagement um, using biophilic uh, sound sources. So there's a, a number of, of products that are emerging on the market right now that that, that focus on that. And these can be deployed um, throughout a floor, floor plate or in discrete areas where when we think about choice, maybe there is an area for respite. Thinking about hospitals, for instance, which for many are workplaces, um, that burnout is is real. And finding ways to combat that by providing choice with, with areas for respite that uh, tap into some of our biological response to uh, acoustic, acoustically, uh, acoustical ecology uh, and the way that we respond to environmental sound is um, is novel mm. and, and very important. The, the last question I kind of had really is um, around something you mentioned about the idea that well is very holistic in its approach and that sound feels like a good example of a concern of comfort that actually needs to balance all kinds of different users and specific needs. Um, when you kind of sum up the work that you do and the importance of something like Well for the future of our buildings, how do you kind of summarize that? So, you know, it's clearly um, increasing in adoption. Anne Marie mentioned that there's 4 billion square feet of space now um, being used, you know, alongside the Well building standard. But in terms of sound specifically, what are your kind of intentions for the future and, and the way that that becomes such an important part? I really think it comes down to finding ways to have designers experience what those spaces are going to sound like well in advance of, of laying down any type of, of, of material uh, component. When we think about the, the, the future of that holistic design, it, can't, it, it must go hand in hand with 
decarbonization efforts, uh, in, in embodied carbon uh, movements, uh, lower materiality. And that means that we can't just hope that our design considerations meet acoustic outcomes. We have to really work with emerging technologies that can help us uh, oralize and, and realize what those spaces sound like well in advance. So there's some really excellent programs that are emerging that can help us do that. Um, and one thing that I'm trying to focus on as sort of a, a, a leading voice in this field is to get architects to be aware of those platforms and uh, make sense or make heads of tails, heads or tails of, of what exactly those software um, uh, can spit out in terms of meaningful metrics. That's brilliant. Thanks so much for your time today. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. Our next speaker will be providing some brilliant case studies of workplace and office design, including their own office renovation. Julian Demetz of DMFK Architects, a practice with some fantastic work in this sector. So could you start by introducing yourself, please, Julian? Hi there, uh, my name is Julian Demetz. I'm the director of DMFK Architects. Um, we are a central London-based um, practice um, specialising in, uh, well, a lot of existing buildings, but mostly at the moment we are concerned with um, offices and um, uh, as a practice, um, we have been engaged with um, working with people like the Office Group. We were one of the first practices um, to design a building. Actually, we designed their first building for the Office Group. And we've kind of evolved um, uh, the whole narrative around agile uh, offices. And um, obviously, going into COVID and coming out of COVID, uh, a lot of the issues and the, 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 the things that were driving them as a firm uh, have become fairly widespread across the industry uh, and um, now uh, I would say we're doing it across a whole range of different kind of office suppliers. Um, as a practice we uh, are about 45 of us, we're based up at, on Charlotte Street. Um, we employ architects and interior um, architects who can do interiors as well. We don't really see um, much of a distinction between them because we think the buildings and the interiors all flow into one another. Um, uh, and we are three directors uh, and a whole range of different uh, um, uh, practitioners um, who, who understand interiors, like I said. Um, I took this photo a few days ago. Um, uh, I just walked into the office. This is of our, of our brand new office on Charlotte Street. Um, we had created this space at the front here. Um, it's got this long five meter table in it and it's um, intended to be a collaboration space, um, one that we never really had before in our previous office. Um, and I think it's sort of, um, it, it sort of forms the basis of what I'm going to talk about um, uh, today um, because um, without really asking anyone or telling everyone to set up, people just had started using it. Um, they use it for, uh, this was a, um, uh, a lunchtime chat on Revit protocols. Um, but I would say that collaboration uh, and the ability for people to come together um, physically is probably the main feature of the office um, as we see it at the moment. Uh, and it was really lovely to see this. Um, so what I was going to do was sort of to take you through um, a load of different projects that um, DMFK do um, and try and focus on a few uh, key issues which we think are important to the office. Um, I made this list um, were some things that I thought um, were really determining and driving uh, the way we're looking at offices today. Um, the first one, attraction. So you can't force people to come into the office. Um, you're competing with the home uh, and you're trying to get people to come back into the office by attracting them back. And that has got to be through a whole range of different attributes. And I think that's the main thing that's driving all of our clients at the moment is they are trying to make the kind of spaces that are appealing to tenants um, uh, rather than um, uh, just providing them with a shell for the tenants to do their own thing. They're now starting to um, very heavily design in a lot of different features. Um, distinction is a word that we use a lot um, and I think it, it's an incredibly helpful word. Um, I think in, in the old days of the BCO, I say the old days of the BCO, the BCO would be um, trying to create a standardized um, kind of uh, product. And I think that that, um, as, as an approach, in my opinion, um, has moved on a little bit um, to more a series of values. Um, uh, and, and I think that one of the key things is that um, every building and every office we design has got to be um, distinctive. And I think that um, every place um, has, uh, every office has a different um, 
attraction to a different audience. And I think the more distinct and the more architecturally interesting a building is, um, the more special it is and the more desirable it is in the market compared to a standardized product. Um, homely and comfortable. Um, yes, I think, like I said, we're competing with the home. Uh, and I think there are a couple of elements of that, particularly acoustics, actually, uh, and furnishing and comfort. Um, acoustics is a big one because um, I think that um, with digital communications, so people sitting on Zoom calls, which we do because we work in a hybrid way, uh, we're quite often not meeting people um, face to face all the time. Uh, we want to, our, our preference in our own office is to meet um, together um, as much as possible. Um, but sometimes it's very convenient to have a digital meeting and the office design needs to accommodate that. And I'll show you a few ways that we've done that. Um, I've put convenient EOT stands for end of trip. Um, you need somewhere to 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 put your bike and to have a beautiful have a, have a shower and a nice place to change and to make your life comfortable. Um, um, so you're more encouraged to come to the office. And a lot of the providers are doing that um, to the max at the moment. So providing as many um, um, additional um, amenities to their tenants as possible. Um, flexible. Um, there need to be uh, uh, lots of different. Um, places where you can work within an office. We, we now can work anywhere. We can work on our phones and we're all very comfortable running through our emails when we're on our phone on the tube. So that figures that within the office, I, we, I'm, in my opinion, we need to be providing as many different environments for people to, to, to work as possible, um, to get up, to walk around and also to have more contact with uh, as many different types of people or different people within the office. Whereas in the old days, you might come in and just sit down next to one person and never really move um, and stare at your <clears throat> picture of your family on your table that, that that's that's no longer the way um collaborative and communal i've touched on that already um, um a lot of the reason people come into the office now is because they find perhaps digital um communication is in some way lacking it's not always um the worst thing but there is um, in my view nothing to um compare with um face-to-face -face communication beautiful um Gone are the days where offices are functional. I think that we're competing with homes, like I said, and retail um, for um, design to be one of the key drivers uh, and the key differentiator for any of the, the uh, quality office providers. And of course, sustainable is probably one, on number one on the agenda of most of uh, the tenants. So uh, I am now just going to take you through a few different projects. Um, this one uh, is a project called York House. Uh, which we did for the office group. It was a fairly uninspiring 1980s building you can see up on the top left there. Um, and um, the office group came along and said, you know, what can we do with this building? How can we wake this building up? So we wanted to try and extend the building forward. Uh, and we used this uh, lattice uh, brickwork system where we tried to um, design something that was of the, the original building, uh, but that evolved the story of it and freshened it and create, gave the building a completely new lease of life. So we extended the building forwards. We came up with this system using the original brick of the building. So it's really about understanding the distinctiveness of this place rather than trying to overclad it with something new. Uh, it's very sustainable. The whole thing was done um, using CLT uh, structure inside. Um, to, to, and this was a self-supporting brick um, uh, um, shell on the outside. It also was, um, did a lot of uh, good work stopping solar gain. And then on the interior of the building, very honest. Um, expression of the original uh, structure inside and then when it came to the interiors really trying to make something that was distinctive and that was um, uh, related to the base building that we were working on rather than putting on uh, overlaying uh, another uh, architecture on top of this building um, we looked at the work of Jeffrey Clark and all, 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 all of the, there was a sculpture on the outside of the building designed by Jeffrey Clark and we tried to um, uh, come up with a, an interior look that felt like it sat well with the existing building, which again is also a very sustainable approach because something that is the most appropriate to the base building is the thing that hopefully will last the longest. And then just try to make a building really memorable and distinctive so that when you walk down the street, it wasn't that sleepy building um, that, that um, I showed you in the first photograph. Um, and it's actually something that, that lit up like a lantern uh, and created a real sense of place and identity. Um, on that token, uh, this is another building that we've worked on, the Salters Hall, uh, where um, uh, it was a uh, 1970s livery hall, a brutalist livery hall designed by Basil Spence. Um, and it was a combination of offices, um, mostly offices, but there was also a hall within the building. And we encouraged the, uh, the livery company to open up that hall uh, in order to, to allow its tenants um, this incredible um, facility. In the end, um, uh, ABRSM, the, um, the music um, uh, uh, examination board moved in and they used the hall uh, for um, 
uh, for its um, all its recitals. And actually, this this hall is actually the uh, most acoustically perfect hall in London uh, for um, uh, chamber orchestras. So uh, there was a lot of care gone into uh, acoustics within this project. And I'm going to come on to acoustics in a second. Um, loads of care going into the, um, the, the coming up with an architecture that worked with the original building uh, and um, creating a real sense of place with it. Uh, the offices in this building were fairly fairly straightforward cate offices, but we used actually uh, acoustic materials on the ceilings to try and um, uh, um, uh, dull down the, the the effects of reverberation in the office. Um, before I really get into that point, uh, this is another one uh, which we're doing for a company which we did for a company called Doe in London, um, and um, this is really describes how. Uh, we're really taking a lot of effort, first of all, to make sure that um, we come up with use materials and um, and surfaces that within an office that um, perhaps don't feel immediately office like. Use um, beautiful furniture that's um, both historic and new, uh, and then create as many different options um, for places to sit uh, and to work within the office. So um, lounge areas, um, breakout areas, um, little um, uh, areas outside meeting rooms to have little um, conferences. Um, or a range of different connectable meeting rooms, all with really beautiful furniture in them. And just try to really make sure that everywhere you look in the office, there's a different way to work, which gives you that feeling of um, flexibility and agility within the office. Okay, so this one was the project I showed you at the start, um, which is our, our own office. Um, uh, we've occupied this firstly extremely densely. Um, so we are at less than one per five uh, square meters, so one person per five square meters. And two of the key, uh, things that I wanted to get into this design, or we wanted to get into this design, was um, uh, fabulous acoustics uh, and fabulous air quality. So you can see there in this image, um, we used uh, a product called Sona Spray uh, by a company called Oscar Acoustics. Um, and then we've sprayed that on many of the internal ceilings, and it has absolutely transformed um, the, the, the way that the office has operated. The way we, with the way we use it um, is very flexibly. Um, so we've also used this um, uh, computer system called the Nevi Desk, uh, which enables us to do all our processing on the cloud, which minimizes the amount of hardware in the office, minimizes the amount of heat production. Uh, and we've really, really tried to um, uh, to create an atmosphere where there's lots of different environments and places to work. So we created these little acoustic booths for doing Zoom calls and um, for having private calls. Um, places where you could stand up and work or, or, or little bench seats in the windows, um, communal work areas at the front. You can see again, uh, we use the sauna spray on the ceiling. And, and I would say that is that the use of that product is probably the number one comfortable thing that we can feel in the office that when you are having a conversation with someone, it feels um, acoustically deadened uh, like it might do in your own home. Uh, and it's been that's been one of the, the, the um, most uh, commented on uh, features of the office and that, and that and providing an uh, excellent amount of um, uh, mechanically um, uh, heat recovered fresh air. Uh, and then we're trying to also um, use those uh, desks in a flexible way. So people use it for sketching and drawing. Um, and then we've got a small meeting room, which is actually where, where, where you can see through the window. That's what I'm sitting right now. Um, uh, so connection between people and visual connection with people and just to, to create the maximum amount of flexibility. Um, using areas in flexible ways. So we use our kitchen areas um, for um, uh, for meetings. And, and, and what we find is if we provide these kind of spaces, um, people use them as they were intended. Uh, and the last thing I would point out with, with our office is that um, uh, we've taken an office that was previously uh, a showroom on the ground floor, uh, and it provides uh, our office with an incredible frontage. Um, so we're kind of a bit of a showroom of product, uh, but also of, um, of, of our, our process. Um, all of these things um, uh, go a, a, a long way to making people feel special in the office um, uh, and to feel uh, a sense of well-being. And I think it's that sense of well-being, well-being a lot comes from the way they connect with each other and the number of opportunities they have to uh, engage with each other in different ways, to move around uh, and, and to feel like they're just not locked in a, in a um, standardized place um, on a daily basis. Um, this project here, um, also, uh, um, we are using uh, Sona Spray on, but on a much larger scale. Um, this is all um, uh, early days because it, we, we've still got four months to go on site. It's a 150,000 square foot uh, building for a company called The Office Group. Um, now, uh, this used to be on, it's on Chancery Lane. 
um, and it used to be uh, the main silver vault for London, which still exists in the basement. So the whole narrative of our uh, of our story sort of slightly uh, accommodates and takes in the story of the silver vaults. Um, but when you get into the inside of the building, you can see um, there were some basement spaces. You can see where that tree is growing out of. Um, we've tried to uh, bring light and air into the basement of the building. Uh, and in the basement of the building, you can see here, I don't know if you can see the the plan. I show it because it, it just shows the amount of end of trip facilities that um, are now being provided by by the first class developers. And this is for TOG and Fora. Um, so you can see in the bottom left there, huge amount of bike storage, yoga rooms, gyms, meet, and all mixed up with meeting rooms, changing rooms. They have saunas. Um, there are various different types you can see over in this area here uh, day rooms so you've got everything from auditoriums through to meeting areas that can all be connected together in different ways and connected with the wellness features and also um, instead of what uh, you see a lot is is um, well what should we do with the basement let's make it into um, let's make it a gym actually all of these areas are looking out onto outdoor garden spaces which again is incredibly important so roof terraces have become the number one most marketable uh, feature of any uh, office development that we're doing. These are the upper floors, more roof terraces within the courtyards, and then a mixture of restaurants, breakout spaces, um, different kinds of shared workspaces, and an enormous amount of shared meeting room spaces. Um, the, the upper floors are fairly straightforward, just broken up into um, small offices, but every one of those we have sprayed um, this product uh, called Sona Spray onto the ceilings, um, where we are uh, trying to deaden the acoustic um, qualities of those spaces. Um, this is the reception area, um, which again uh, isn't just a reception area. All the receptions we're doing now are hybrid, so they have a mixture of working, meeting, um, eating, F and B um, that, that are all mixed up within within these type of uh, of spaces. Uh, and again, like I said, um, what one of the uh, key features of pretty much every building we're doing uh, at the moment is um, elements of um, uh, uh, of wellness so gyms um, and um, and everything that would um, attract uh, people back to the office um, again uh, kitchenettes and 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 um, uh, uh, places to to get food all the way around the building so this really in incredibly um, comfortable environment roof terraces etc. Um, this is a project that we did for TOG, um, which is um, Wimpole Street, which kind of, I'll, I'll whip through this one a bit faster, but again, just enormous amounts of shared meeting spaces, um, loads of care on um, inhabiting corridors. So we try never to do corridors without things going on within them uh, and, and trying to make um, uh, our division screens between corridors and, and, and offices uh, and meeting rooms more interesting than doing crittle screens or uh, or plasterboard walls. So we try to where we can where we can afford to do it, spend more money on, on, on really beautiful um, uh, textured um, elements that, that that give those elements the corridors a quality in themselves. This one here, we did a beautiful garden outside within quite a sunken terrace, which was previously just a load of decking with nothing out on it. And the idea of the terrace is that it would be just um, as suitable for um, an event or a party. So the bar, it's got a bar stroke DJ booth, but it also you can sit and work in a greenhouse or have a meeting outside. So it's trying to make spaces that are flexible and multifunctional because people are working, people want as many different options for working uh, as you can offer. Um, little work booths, um, beautiful furniture, uh, and then you can see here little uh, quiet phone booths, little areas for private meetings. Um, just really trying to think about, like I have shown on some of the other projects, every option you can you can come up with for for op uh, ways and fle flexible uh, areas to work, and everywhere, always trying to um, offer up the best quality materials we can. Um, this one's completely different. I'm just showing it because it's flexible. This is a project we did for Uni Unilever that expresses the character of, of, of their organization. This is a big building down in um, uh, in Kingston upon Thames, uh, which we're doing a very similar type of um, product for, but just um, with the identity that Unilever wanted to get across, which is a, a very um, uh, collaborative and communal um, uh, um, training center, which has a lot of the same functions and things that I've mentioned, but just a completely different style. So it's really just pointing out um, that 
this idea of distinctiveness should, um, a lot of our projects are very building focused rather than brand focused and then i'll finish on this just to finish on that point um, this is a building that we're doing for a company called dorrington uh, and it's the last or sorry not the last the first and last a commercial building that cfa voise uh, the famous wallpaper designer british wallpaper designer and uh, um, designed in the um in the, the, the beginning of the 20th century, I think the 20s, uh, and um, it's a, it was the only commercial building he ever did, uh, and it was designed for um, wallpaper manufacture. Uh, and um, I th we, it's grade two star listed, and we engaged with um, H Historic England um, uh, to try and explain and to understand that these buildings, whilst they're um, pieces of history, still need to perform acoustically and thermally um, uh, um, beautifully in order to, um, to, to compete in this market. So we agreed with um, uh, Historic England to drop these very high window sills around this end down to, down to the ground uh, and to replace all the windows with um, a very high thermal performing um, uh, um, win replacement window, uh, which was previously single glazed. And it's just really, I guess, to make the point that... Um, uh, the more distinctive offices are, um, the more attractive they are in this market, um, and they're the ones that are, are letting the most easily. And I think I'll, I'll kind of leave it there. That's fantastic. That Thank you. Yeah, that's a, what a brilliant set of uh, examples. It's um, it's so inspiring to to see them. You mentioned um, being inspired by homes, by hotels, by retail, and there's a real warmth and tactility to the spaces that you're creating in your own office, the solid oak, the timber joinery, the lighting, those lanterns that are hanging down. It looks like a beautiful place to work. You obviously arrived at a sort of aesthetic. Can you talk a little bit more about that and, and where that comes from? Um, for, for us, I mean, it's not for everybody, but it suits our organization. We just want to, we have got a lot of people in quite a small space, um, smallish space. Uh, and didn't want it to feel busy. I wanted to have a calmness about it. Uh, and calmness comes in lots of different ways. You know, when you open your front door and you shut it and you walk into a house, there's a sort of closeness and a acoustic calm that you feel. Um, and and we wanted the office just to feel warm and comfortable and um, not hassly. Um, so that's kind of where we started. Um, uh, some of the, if you're talking about materials specifically, um, yeah, we wanted to have some natural materials in the office and, um, uh, and just w warm, warm, natural quality materials. Um, I didn't want it to feel super lively. There may well be somebody else who <laughs> who wants to feel something <laughs> completely different. But for us, um, and I, I guess also uh, contrast in the lighting uh, is very important to us. So um, the idea of the lanterns is, you know, we've got quite good controls in the office, so you can kind of mm. dim and move things around. So people really do play with that stuff. Um, so, yeah, it was really, it, it, I think that um, uh, homes, retail offices, all starting to um, borrow or, or borrow from each other um, a, a great deal. So I don't think that an office should necessarily look like an office. Um, and, sim and I think that we've given a massive prompt um, in that by all having to work from our homes for a couple of, for a year or so. Yeah, I was interested in that. A key topic, obviously, is acoustic management. And um, you mentioned it a few times in your presentation. But the idea, I guess, have those team conversations or private phone calls you know, being easier to manage as a result of the changes that you've made? Um, well, you've got the general space where um, any acoustic attenuation, so we've got curtains, um, felt curtains, which help a lot. Um, the ceiling spray helps a lot, um, and it's properly noticeable the day that we put it in. Um, and then uh, little acoustically um, deadened booths with traps around the edges mm. of them, which are done with um, with felt and, and, and rock wool and to, 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 to um, uh, absorb people's conversations when they're talking into them make a massive, massive difference. Um, so when you talk to agents um, and they look at London, for example, I, I presume most people watching this will be maybe from the UK, but um, or a, a, any city, um, there are parts of London, like we, we happen to have taken this office in Charlotte Street, we got lucky, um, and we managed to, afford, this area has gone kind of mad. And the reason why mm. it's gone mad and people are renting offices here is the type of businesses who are attracted to this and also just the colour of the area. Um, it's mm. an area that's got 
beautiful restaurants and park and and Soho and stuff, uh, and it's attractive and it's and it's heterogeneous as an area. It's like lots going on, and people want to be there. So I get up in the morning. I think, yeah, I'm going to come into town because I want to sort of see a bit of the colour. And I think there are other offices in sort of more fringy areas that are more questionable. And I think that either some of those need to become more campus-like, provide more amenities, depending on the value of the area. But you look at the, I look at the city of London, for example, and you know it's a challenge there sometimes because it's a zoned. This is a zone city in some ways. You know, the city is getting more colourful, but previous was very businessy. Um, yeah. So I think those areas are presenting a challenge. That's just a lot of our work at the moment is trying to reposition buildings in the city. Um, you know, um, and I think it's happening. You know, there's lots more nice restaurants and cool stuff when you walk out the door, and it's that that makes these areas um, sort of exciting to come back to. Um, so I think, like I said, like the first word I wrote on that list was attraction. Um, yeah. you know, it's, that comes down to locale, locale as well as the buildings. You know, so it, it does remain a question: is if, if you've got a very bland office in a bland place, you know, <clears throat> what you do. But I think I think it, that then maybe the market is um, sort of people who live locally or you know, and, and, and more campusy. Like I said. Um, you know where you're where you're trying to sort of retain people there if you look at like say here east which is quite far out um you yeah. know office up you know you see people doing big yoga classes in the middle of the courtyards and stuff you know they're trying to do stuff to make it function uh, as a as a campus um so and there look there'll always be a solution and a value to everything but um, yeah um i don't think it's dead at all <laughs> not around here is julian <laughs> Thank you so much for your time. Right. I massively appreciate it and for taking us through those projects as well. It's incredibly interesting and you know I really value your expertise. So thanks so much. Pleasure. Thanks very much. Finally, we're going to hear from Ben Hancock at Oscar Acoustics, talking about how good acoustic design can contribute to all kinds of workplace and health factors and demonstrate some of the products in their offering. Welcome, Ben. Hi, I'm Ben Hancock, Director of Oscar Acoustics, Great Britain's number one spray applied acoustic decorative finishes specialist. We actually created an industry that didn't previously exist around 25 years ago. I'm going to be discussing health and well-being, what employees think of high noise levels in the workplace and how our range of environmentally friendly recycled acoustic sprays can play their part in improving health. Those of you who've seen my presentations before may have seen this slide. Noise pollution is a serious problem. The chief medical officer in England pre-COVID said it's second only to air pollution in damaging public health, while WHO highlights issues such as tinnitus, sleep disturbance, heart disease, obesity, diabetes, adverse birth outcomes and cognitive impairment in children. In order to better understand the situation in the workplace, Oscar Acoustics commissioned a new workplace survey of 2,000 bosses from across the UK. This white paper is available uh, for free to download via our website. I presented these findings in presentations at the end of last year, so I thought it would be a good idea to dig out the findings of the previous survey that focused on employees' knowledge of noise and the effects it's having on them. Respondents came from organisations of all sizes, with half from larger employers and the remainder from SMEs. The survey was professionally conducted via one poll. And it was exploring the views of UK employees across a range of different sectors. The research reveals some surprising and concerning effects of noise pollution and a worrying lack of action taken against it and a dearth of knowledge about the associated health risks. There are a few headline alarming statistics. Companies' bottom lines are under threat as three quarters, 74% of Brits say noise stops them from doing a good job. Over half, 54%, say their employer has not done enough to take action. Breakdown in workplace relationships as 29% of us have snapped at a colleague, including 11% at a superior, and a fifth, 19%, have poor relationships with co-workers due to work-related clamour. Employees' health could be in danger as 90% don't realise excessive noise can increase the likelihood of heart attacks and strokes. What is the most common way to escape noise? Our survey says 25% of us use headphones to drown out the racket. This is actually increasing the issue 
by a potential nine decibels. And one in five of you know of colleagues missing calls or ignoring their boss. Have you ever done any of the following as a result of excessive noise in your workplace? So asked to move to another desk, millennials are far higher than any other age ranges with males double that of females. Similar trends for formal complaints, snapping at co-workers and, and at superiors. Um, this is where things start to get very interesting. Passive aggressive notes. It's those millennials, again, with over double that of any other age range and 10 times that of people 50 plus. Males being nearly four times that of females. The one that really blew me away, though, was physical violence. Millennials were on average 7.5 times more likely to resort to this than other age ranges, with males being more than six times more than female. It also shows that if you're working in London, you're over 3.5 times more likely than anywhere else in the UK to leave passive aggressive notes and over seven times more likely to resort to physical violence as a result of excessive noise. Given the effects on morale, productivity, health um, and health, employers are all over this, right? Our survey says that 54% said their employer has taken no action to combat it. 42% said they don't even take the issue seriously. If only they were building certification teams that architects and contractors could work towards when designing new workplaces. Well, and there's no fire, finer reference than our spray applied products uh, than Delos, the company that founded the well building standard using Sonar Spray FCX through their. Um, HQ in New York, the architects Gensler recommending the product to their client's specification team. And as you'd expect, the building is built to the very highest standard of well and to achieve LEED V4 Platinum and Living Building Challenge certification. The well building standard is broken into categories for which Sonar Spray contributes towards satisfying many, including uh, the light reflectivity of a surface. Um, of course, acoustics are a big part of it as well with multiple categories on it. And strict controls on VOCs in products used. Loving the treadmill, by the way, um, at the meeting table. I believe that's under the um, heading active furnishings. Uh, might be slightly distracting in a meeting, but um, pretty cool. The emissions of products used in the build are, are also becoming increasingly important with more certification systems dedicating entire sections to it. Our products achieve M1 um, for low emitting building materials. That's the, the, the best uh, you can get. Um, compliant with the California Department of Public Health. They're Green Guard Gold certified uh, for indoor air quality. You've also got Briam's version. Um, they've got EPDs and also uh, LEED as well. Our well-being also depends heavily on the survival of our planet, so environmental qualities are just as important. Our finishes are made from high-grade recycled paper and renewable plant-based fibres uh, with specialist water-based adhesives treated to achieve Class O fire rating. So Sonar Spray, uh, Sonar Spray range also contributes to many sustainable design certification systems and standards, uh, including also of course, Brian, Lead, Scar, Living Building Challenge, and Passive House. All installations are carried out by our fully trained in house teams. To complete the environmental jigsaw, Oscar Acoustics are ISO 14001 certified. We're also now committed to becoming carbon negative for our entire operation. For those who aren't familiar with the Sone Spray range, here's a very brief summary with some pretty pictures. So it's a range of five, starting with the coarsest finish Sonar Spray K13. This is a pre-start photo of a project with uh, rib deck and foil face beams. And this is uh, the finished photo, K13 refurbishing and acoustically treating in one go. This is the same product onto plasterboard at Notting Hill Prep School. 
And the next product is Sona Spray K13 Special. Uh, this goes through the milling process for longer, resulting in a slightly finer finish than the standard K13. You can see it here applied between the, uh, the, the restored beams. Uh, and here directly onto concrete with deliberate shadow gaps around the edge created in a stop bead. Sona Spray FC is finer still and actually the uh, finest non troud finish we do. As a result, it's still extremely fast to install. Um, and you can see here it's been installed um, on the concrete around this, um, this atrium at the Blavatlik School of Government. They originally tried to do this in acoustic panels, but then gave up after just three. And again, applied onto this scruffy concrete soffit here, um, a huge difference. Sony Spray FCX is sprayed and troweled to give a flat but pitted surface, a little bit like a, an arctic white render. Um, we sell quite a lot of this because actually in the right light it looks very similar to the, uh, the smooth acoustic plasters but can be installed in a fraction of the time because it's only one process as opposed to a few with drying times um, and also you know, cost as well as a result. A huge advantage of this finish is also that it's applied to the specific depth rather than having a rigid baseboard. So it will take the shape of nearly anything, including elaborate GRG shaped ceilings. Oscar Elite is the smoothest acoustic plaster on the market, uh, typically appearing smoother than conventional roller painted plaster. Um, you can see here in this reception, I mean, it really just does look like standard uh, plaster if that's what you're after. Uh, the advantage we have over other acoustic plasters is, is we're able to sand the final coat. Um, so others have unforgiving resin bound finishes and you're sort of limited to what you can achieve with the trowel. So if you've got trowel marks because you're doing a very tricky shape, uh, that's what you're left with. Whereas we can actually sand that out and sand things smooth. So how well do our acoustic sprays work now? I've got this uh, very short video. You'll have to, it was a very relaxed site, so excuse the lack of uh, PPE, but um, two rooms here. Uh, the one we're in just now um, is identical to the one we're about to go through. The one we're in now hasn't been treated at all with the, uh, the K13. And the, the next room we're going to move into is about 70% treated. And actually, the reverb you're hearing is from the 30% that hasn't yet been sprayed. Not the most professional video, so uh, please uh, forgive that. But um, I just I arrived on the site and the difference was so huge. We just had to get something down on a phone. Uh, it's been, been quite handy. So due to the popularity of the product, we've hugely outgrown our current premises and are about to start building a new 16,000 square foot Oscar Innovation Center. Uh, this comprises of large warehouses and a product development facility cloaked by a brick facade hiding the warehouse from the road and the houses opposite. I'm not going to go into any detail on this today. Uh, I'm going to save it for another uh, presentation and, and do it in full. Um, what this does enable us to do though is A, meet our rapid expansion needs and B, create a brand new show home for all our products. So once built, uh, probably around the end of the year, we'd love to invite everyone to drop by for a coffee and see all our products in situ. Um, this will include our amazing new Oscar Evo blade razor edge ceiling trim that turns bulky ceiling buildups with upstands into elegant wafer thin sheets. Um, it's all des also designed for both conventional and acoustic plaster finishes and has been used in the worldwide rollout design of um, a high end British fashion brand to recreate their iconic check pattern on their ceilings. There's a great new Evo Blade video on our website and also on our YouTube channel. So um, we'll also try and send out a link to those who have subscribed after this webinar. So please do follow us on our social media channels or check 
like uh, send me a LinkedIn invite um, to see our projects and also download our latest white paper on um, acoustic treatment in the workplace. I'm Ben Hancock. Thank you very much. Excellent stuff. Thanks so much, Ben. So the final thing to show you is how to achieve some of those health and well-being performance criteria in MBS Chorus. And we'll also look at finding product information in MBS Source. So with that in mind, I've got a very simple couple of specifications in this office refurbishment project. Um, and if we look at first the cause content and something like panel partitions, within the content here, there are often clauses like timber procurement, in this case, um, how to source um, and find timber with the right uh, certification, um, and guidance um, on the right-hand side, helping you to uh, understand the various options that are there. And that kind of quality of materials and the choices that you're making and um, helping to avoid um, finding materials that are going to off gas and, and all of the things that have been talked about in the session. But also um, within the uh, sections themselves, something like these panel partitions, you've got the ability to specify real performance content, in this case, fire resistance, but also, as we've been mentioning, uh, sound resistance to British uh, Europe norm ISO standards um, and to put the exact uh, levels of performance that you're requiring for those particular panels. Looking at the um, content of our uh, project again, I've got here some Uniclass content. And within the Uniclass content in particular, um, it's worth mentioning that all of those clauses um, contain system performance. Um, and that goes for not just the architectural content, but our services content in a lot of cases too. Um, for example, something like the lighting performance, which we've talked about, the importance of light levels uh, within the office and workplaces that we're talking about, Av um, average minimum lux levels, um, color rendering for comparison, color temperature, how warm that light is, and um, all of those things can be specified using our content um, with guidance on the right-hand side, uh, helping you to make those decisions all the way through. Going back to um, our architectural specification here, um, it's also worth looking at the product information that we can begin to find. Um, and here we've got the uh, sprayed monolithic coatings for the kind of acoustic coatings that we've been talking about with Oscar Acoustics today. Um, and when we click on the uh, manufacturer prompt within this particular clause, um, that's where you can see the available product information. And this has been delivered directly from MBS Source. If you are interested in any of these uh, items, that's when you can then read more about the particular item that you're looking at, the various third party certifications and benefits that that product might have. But if you click on the bottom right hand corner here, you can then go directly to that product within MBS Source itself. In MBS Source, there's then all of the additional information about that particular product. Um, one thing that we've added recently is this traffic light system showing you when this was last verified by the manufacturer so that you know you're getting the most up-to-date version of this content and that ranges haven't disappeared and that kind of thing. You can also see if there's digital object information associated with it. And for a long time, we've been able to compare um, similar uh, content um, alongside uh, one another and be able to see and compare those products um, to see their properties uh, side by side. One of the things that we've um, been able to add uh, recently is where a product has variants. So in this case, the um, depth of finish for this particular acoustic spray, you can also now compare the variants. So in this case, I can choose um, different levels of that particular finish um, and then compare the performance, for example, uh, between each of those. So that we can see here that the um, performance, say, might be different at certain Hertz levels um, for the sound absorption and that the uh, coefficients are going to change depending on the levels that are being used there. So real depth of quantity of uh, the content that we've got um, and a really uh, in-depth data that's behind the scenes there. The last thing I wanted to show you was this new inspiration area, which we've added to MBS Source. Uh, where you can actually begin to see different project categories. For example, if we were looking at workplaces and office spaces, we can see the most recent content being added by our manufacturers um, as inspiration for your next project, whether that's flooring or particular um, solutions, um, glazing or uh, entryways. You've got all of the types of inspiration data there. 
Um, and also to be able to um, choose particular products that you might want to look at. So in this case, if I search for bricks, then we can see here um, all of the recent uh, images that have been added uh, that have to do with clay bricks. So a really useful way to find the inspiration content that you're looking for. Just search in this bar and you'll be able to find inspirational images that should hopefully inspire you for your next project. Thanks so much to all of our speakers today. Please pop a message in the chat if you'd like further information from any of them. And visit the MBS.com to learn more about how MBS, MBS Chorus and MBS Source can help you produce great specification information. If you have any questions at all, please drop us an email at info at the MBS.com. Thanks again to our sponsors for today, Oscar Acoustics, and thanks to you for attending. Goodbye.